It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, leadership and what every medical student needs to know. I feel slightly embarrassed actually um, talking about this because um, clearly you all have leadership skills in spades. You're here on a Sunday morning uh, in the midst of uh, one of the uh, most dramatic uh, weather situations for a long time uh, to start a lecture at 9.15. So I hope that this isn't going to sound at all patronising. Um, just so you get to see and exploring what I wanted to do with my life. But the Dean is an elected post. I'm a trustee of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, one of four <coughs> honorary officers, along with um, Professor Wendy Byrne, who's our president, who you met uh, yesterday our registrar and treasurer and I basically look after the educational portfolio of the college so everything from outreach to school careers uh, trying to influence undergraduate medical uh, curriculum through training uh, exams and continuing uh, professional uh, development and it is great fun but I'm going to start off and talk about why leadership is fundamental to what all of us do every day in our roles working as doctors in healthcare systems. It's all about patients. And yesterday, I know that you saw the film, our Choose Psychiatry uh, film, uh, which is all about patients. So everybody on that film, and those were real psychiatrists that were filmed, it all, uh, and the patient stories are all based on uh, real patient uh, words and dialogue played by actors, uh, but it's all about making a difference to patients. And thousands of books have been uh, written on the subject, some very academic, some less so, and you will have come across uh, some of those, but all curious about searching for what is really very hard to define, the key ingredients that make a good leader. I'm sure that you will all you know, have in your minds images of people that you respect, who, who, who you feel are good uh, leaders, and you'll all have uh, also examples of people who you feel are extremely bad uh, leaders, and I'm not going to make any political comments, but I shall uh, leave, leave, leave that all to your imagination. But I've got a really straightforward definition about what leadership is. It's a process of influencing others to engage their support to achieve a shared goal. And it sounds really straightforward. So let me tell you about my very first experience of having leadership thrust upon me. Because it was a complete, unmitigated uh, disaster. Is there anybody in the audience who's been a brownie, a girl guide, a cub scout, a scout, boys brigade, girls brigade? So quite a lot of you, so we're, we're, we're in good hands, we're all prepared. So picture me aged 11, probably quite hard to do, bright, uh, keen, and to be honest, a bit gauche. And I'd had a lot of fun being a brownie, um, but now is the time to leave and move on, and I could have gone to two different Girl Guide uh, troops or, or, or groups where I lived, but the decision was taken out of my hands. We had a neighbour where I lived who was a district commissioner, and she was concerned about a failing group in the city that needed a bit of bolstering. It was in a disadvantaged part of town, and she cooked up this idea, along with my mother, that it would be really good for them both, uh, for, for, for them and for me, to join uh, the one uh, that was struggling rather than the one that all my school friends were um, going to. And as an unassertive 11-year-old, I went along with the plan. And that was the very first lesson to me in leadership, to understand and be aware of other people's agendas. So I turned up and uh, Ms May, who was a very regimental, buxom uh, leader, took me aside at the end of the first meeting and she said she was delighted I joined because I was clearly leadership material. Well, frankly, she could have been talking Chinese. I took it as a compliment, although I really had no idea what she was talking about. And within months, I was promoted to patrol leader, the youngest smallest and least experienced member. And that was my second lesson in leadership, be really aware of setting other people up to fail. I had an objective, we've talked about having objectives in leadership, 
And my objective was to achieve all things excellent in girl guiding. And this would be loosely measured by my patrol winning awards, being on time, having polished badges and shoes. And in an attempt to be the perfect role model, I developed a close acquaintance with brass and polish, took to starching my necktie, seriously. Um, life is far too short, but I didn't quite realise that at the time. So I threw myself into useful activities, I passed my scribes badge, and maybe in retrospect that isn't, you know, was, has been of more relevance uh, dealing with NHS bureaucracy over the years, uh, given the amount of uh, record keeping we all do. But I failed in my objective to achieve things generally excellent in girl guiding, because my objective was simply that, it was my objective, it was not our collective objective. And what other teenagers, in their right mind, honestly want to spend their free time doing that kind of stuff? So my third lesson in leadership was, and I should have learned it at the time and probably didn't realise till many years later, was that you can't do it. You can't change things on your own. You need an agreed common goal that everyone signed up to. And as excellent as I wanted to make my patrol, it was simply not going to happen without others wanting it to, too. So I limped along a bit despondent, turning up every week, all shiny, but going home frustrated that I was failing to achieve my objective. So the fourth lesson for me was that you need to be able to talk about these things safely and in confidence. Well, the Girl Guides didn't provide leadership mentoring back in the 1970s, 80s. And if they did, then, well, the story might have been quite different. But eventually I retired prematurely from the Girl Guys at the age of 14. I wrote a letter, a polite letter to the group leader with the excuse that I really needed more time to focus on my homework. And the mistake that I made then was not to understand that leaders are not necessarily born <coughs> and certainly not expected to have fully developed set of skills as a teenager. And of course leaders develop, but for a while I decided that I was not an innate leader, and that was my fifth lesson. So for many years I kept my head down, did my homework, which was probably a good thing because it meant that I got into uh, medical uh, school. But what I did during that time was always to have a strong sense of my own values and priorities. When I asked to be a school pre prefect, I politely declined. I had serious misgivings about the leadership at my um, inner city comprehensive school. And its leadership, in retrospect, was weak. And I decided that spending my free time policing the playground and chasing smokers out of the toilets was not really a good use of my time. Um, and by now, I was starting to develop some good leadership <coughs> skills. Kate, eyebrows have been raised. Whose, I replied, you'll never get into university, you know, they'll take a dim view. And that was a very valuable lesson too. My sixth lesson, I learned that making values-based decisions never gets you into serious trouble. Strong leaders and organisations welcome argument and debate and bullying leadership never wins. But my first <coughs> attempt at leadership had really failed. Failure and success are hugely emotive words. We think of success often as power, fame and wealth, but actually that says more about us, uh, about our own values and what we project onto it. Because in simple terms, success means simply achieving what you've set out to achieve. Achieving something you've set out to achieve. And leaders help show the way. So how have I got from failing girl guide patrol leader to Dean of the Royal College of Psychiatrist? One of the most intriguing leaders I think of recent times is the late Steve Jobs, the brilliant CEO of Apple Inc. A man who had known and learned from significant failure in his life. And he said famously, you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. So to cut a very long story short, I worked hard at school, I got into medical school and went to the universities of St Andrews and Manchester. I qualified as a doctor at the age of 22 and I was lucky to have had really positive experience of psychiatry as a student. I got a distinction in my finals 
and after house jobs, foundation programme equivalents and internal medicine, I joined the Manchester Psychiatric Training Scheme. I followed my husband to the South West uh, when he got a consultant post in anaesthetics, finished my training off down here and started work as a consultant in 2001. And my first job was really lovely. I worked with a wonderful team in South Ham's part of uh, Devon. Many of you will have been there on holiday. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and I worked on an inpatient unit in Plymouth, the Glenbourne unit. We set up lots of lots of new things. We set up a primary care liaison team. Uh, I improved teaching. I obtained funding to um, have the first PowerPoint projector in Plymouth. It was a year's battle. It's one of my biggest achievements of my career. <laughs> um, uh, we got accreditation for our inpatient unit. We became a productive award. We won awards, campaigned and got inpatient psychology, which at the time was extremely rare. We had a housing officer. We really thought carefully about many of the social determinants of illness in our patients. We had a financial support worker, family and friends liaison worker. And we were a true multidisciplinary team focused on improving the lives of people with mental illness. We were cooking on gas, as one of my old secretaries used to say. And although I tend to look back on those days as halcyon, we were successful. We achieved what we set out to achieve, and it wasn't without twists and turns uh, and problems. And I remember at the beginning of a very <coughs> trying day, um, after a trying day, um, at the end of the day, speaking with my husband, and he said, well, one day, Kate, he said, you'll wake up and you've achieved all the things you set out to achieve. You'll have a psychologist in your team and housing support and everything. Um, and he was right. And I just, you know, be that encourager. Um, it's important to have people supporting you, encouraging you along the way. So excellence is about being the best you possibly uh, can be, but you need to start where you are and set realistic goals. I was successful. I went on to set up an integrated um, crisis resolution home treatment team, bringing disparate people from across the um, uh, county together and creating a culture of learning, fun and pride in what we did. We had an absolute blast uh, and we did everything we could to influence what we could. But for several different uh, reasons and um, I felt that I'd probably achieved as much as I could do. My family was growing, their needs were changing and I did an internal um, uh, swap within my organisation to take on a new post looking after an inpatient unit. Like all good leaders I'm slow to take personal credit for successes of teams but very quick to shoulder responsibility and blame when it goes wrong. Um, and um, I had a really uh, difficult um, experience when I went to this new job. I'm not going to talk too much about the details of that because it was a brutal and difficult experience. And you undoubtedly too will have the joys of huge successes in your careers, but also uh, times when things feel like they're going badly wrong. And I think we don't talk about that often uh, enough. Um, my new job um, was very similar to when I turned up at the Girl Guides. There were significant uh, development needs, the nursing leadership on the unit was weak and staff on the ground were unsupported and just like I turned up in the Girl Guides when I was 11, keen, shiny, uh, determined to um, make a difference, what I hadn't quite realised was quite what a low starting point we were at compared to my previous ward. I knew where we needed to go, I had clear objectives but no allies. I was isolated, marginalised and probably seen as a bit of a threat but others didn't share my vision about excellence in patient care and the shared vision amongst the staff on the ward was merely about survival. And it was a perfect storm despite working very hard and I lost track of how many audits we'd done, how many quality improvement projects, I failed to get anywhere. Um, and to cut a very long story short, we had the highest sickness rate in the organisation, only about 20% of our staff were having regular supervision. 
And 15 months later, after yet another incident, I raised concerns that the environment was toxic, it was defensive and distracting from providing best patient care. After I raised concerns to the Chief Executive, the ward was closed, um, or a decision was made to close the ward within 24 hours, and uh, we closed the ward a week later on the grounds of being unable to staff the ward safely. Funnily enough, nobody ever gives you any training on uh, how to close a ward. I hadn't had it in my postgraduate training, hadn't had it in my undergraduate training. It was a case of making it up as you went along. And complex and rapid decisions needed to be made about patient disposal. Those were the words that we used. I found it very difficult, but that's what it felt like. We had patients who'd been uh, resident on the ward, sometimes for quite a number of uh, weeks, uh, and we were make, needing to make very difficult, um, complex decisions. And, of course, about looking after our staff, about redeploying them very quickly. So I'd gone to this unit with a clear objective. We were going to be the best ward, certainly in the county, if not beyond. I had clear strategies, but I failed to achieve the goal. A goal. And in retrospect, it was a perfect storm, and I think it was impossible, and I think the best decision was to make to close it. But his problems there were historic, they were well known, and other good people before me had failed to turn it around. So like all good leaders, I am very slow to take personal credit for when things go well, but quick to shoulder responsibility and blame when it goes wrong. And I know that later on today, you're talking about well-being, about how we can keep ourselves well. But I felt heartbroken. I felt that I'd failed my team, my patients, patients of the future, and I took it very hard. To say I was heartbroken, that uh, would be close to how personally painful it was. And it was then, you know, decades into my career, that I learned what was my seventh lesson of leadership, that leaders need to be kind to themselves, realistic, and appreciate that sometimes a good outcome can look very different from the one that was anticipated. I also learned the eighth lesson of leadership, that we're all human, we're vulnerable, and need to keep, take care of our own well-being because nobody else is going to do that for us. Healthy teams have healthy people in them. And keeping well and looking out for each other is absolutely critical. And what I've um, found very, very helpful in thinking about this <coughs> personally and for other people that I work with and, and, and support is the five ways to well-being. It might sound really crazy, but I had that on the front of my phone for a long time. And sometimes when it's just starting to feel a little bit busy, I dig it out and kind of go back to thinking, you know, how balanced is your life at the moment? Are you doing all the things that you need to do to keep well? And it's very straightforward. I mean, this is sort of distilled from um, good scientific research and getting world experts together. But the things that people, that experts think keep us well are connecting with others. All the things you've been doing uh, this weekend, uh, you know, reaching out to other people. Giving. The giving of our time, of our skills and talents. Third thing is learning something new. <coughs> Being mindful, noticing um, the world, the environment around us and exercise, doing something physically active that you enjoy. So after my ward closed, my job no longer existed and I was very grateful to be able to transfer to a vacant community post. And when I went there, I actually had, I was quite bruised and I had very, very limited objectives. One was to survive and the second one was to be a really good colleague because I'd been on the receiving end of having good colleagues and some not so good colleagues and realised quite how important that was. Um, the people that we work with are absolutely uh, key. Um, and again, that was my ninth lesson of uh, leadership. Mahatma Gandhi said, to be the change you wish to see in the world, and how right he was. So that was my goal, to be that good colleague for others. And it was kind of really easy in those circumstances to be a good colleague. Failing and being visibly vulnerable had been one of my nightmares in life. It is for a lot of us, I suspect, if we were to have a conversation just now, you'd probably all be saying, oh my goodness, that really, really scares me. But you know what? Failing is actually the best way to win friends, 
and to influence people, colleagues flock to my door in confidence, talking about their own difficult experiences, subsequent connections and strengthened relationships that occurred had nothing but a beneficial effect for me. And I firmly believe that I wouldn't be standing here as Royal College of Psychiatrist Dean had I not had that very difficult experience. And over the next three years, my team existed in the choppy waters of the NHS with three different um, forms in constant reorganisations that frequently blight the NHS. But I'll always be very grateful to my former chief executive when she first started at the Trust because she came round and she toured the teams. And when she came to see me, a trusted colleague and I put to her our concerns about some of the issues, about the impact of the restructuring on delivering good patient care and what we saw as potential solutions. And within an hour of leaving that meeting, the medical director called me up to say he was interested to hear my ideas. The chief executive had clearly intervened. And I think that's one of the best uh, management interventions in the history of my career. Um, so that was my tenth lesson, that between us we have the solution, but listening is absolutely key. And how often are we not listening? How often do we not hear uh, the solutions that are right under our noses? So we were allowed with the support of our local manager and the blessing of our director to redesign the model of delivery. Uh, and we got to the stage where we were fully staffed, we had no long-term sickness, we were cons consistently green on our dashboard uh, for all uh, our goals and objectives from supervision um, to care program approach meetings. And again, the key was having a shared objective, clear shared objectives, strategy and tactics. So throughout my career, I've taken a keen interest in medical education, being the daughter of a teacher, uh, and a Samaritan, the fact that I ended up as Dean of the Royal College of Psychiatrists maybe isn't quite so surprising. I've said already that my uh, role at the college is to lead the educational portfolio. Um, and there's no real good course that can uh, really prepare you for the role. It's something for, I think, that takes clear values, good communication, and often an ability to go back to first principles an ability to think in different paradigms. So what I thought I'd do now, I've kind of given you um, some reflections from uh, an experience, a couple of experience of leadership um, I've had, but what I thought I would uh, move on to, to talk is about some of the values that I think leaders uh, have, about one of the values that I think is probably the most important, to talk you through some um, learning uh, theory um, and then hopefully put it all together at the end. So, here we go. Yeah, thank you. See, teamwork. <laughs> so, I've talked about some initial uh, reflections uh, in uh, the leadership. Um, and Values. So these are our values that we have at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. We've spent a lot of time thinking about what leadership values um, are important um, to us as an organisation. And this is what we've come up with. It neatly spells circle. At one stage when we were discussing it, it spelled Circe, and we thought um, that that was probably not a good um, association. So as Dean, we thought we should end. Uh, have some learning you know, added an L to expel circle. But courage, you need to be really brave to face up, to stand up uh, when things are not going as they should be. Um, innovation, being able to do things differently, to think in different ways uh, when things are getting stuck. Respect for each other. And particularly thinking about equality and diversity, because we know that when diverse groups of people come together uh, and work together, we're much more likely uh, to uh, have good results. Collaborating, talked about that, learning uh, and excellent. So, one of the most important sort of aspects of leadership I think I've faced is, is learning. Um, and it's absolutely key to us being able to grow and improve. 
and yet there's an awful lot that can get in the way of learning. And I don't know how much um, any of you have these days in your undergraduate curriculum about um, principles of learning and, and, and so on. I certainly didn't have those days. Um, and it was only when I became a consultant and was involved in, in sort of postgraduate education as a teacher that I started to have some uh, teaching on it and, and, and then subsequently sort of developed an interest. You will all, in your courses, do a lot of reflective practice. Is there anybody who doesn't have to do reflective practice and stick reflections into portfolios? <coughs> Pretty, yeah. I meet a lot of medical students who say, oh, we reflected out, we just sit with that and reflect all the time. And I thought I'd, I'd sort of spend a bit of time actually going back to first principles and thinking about what reflection is. Because again, you know, you meet many sort of burnt out consultants who are not reflecting at all. Um, so there we are. So the physicist amongst you will remember um, that reflection, one definition, is a change in a direction of a wavefront and an interface between two media, so that the wavefront returns the medium from which it uh, originated. Uh, reflective to think about the seeing a picture of baby looking in the mirror. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I think there is something extremely important that we should all be really closely examining who we are and what we do, difficult though that may be. So the Royal, uh, the Academy of Medical Royal College's definition of reflection is a process whereby an individual thinks analytically about anything relating to a professional practice with the intention of gaining insight and using the lessons learned to maintain good practice or make improvements where possible. I thought I'd just talk a little bit about the history of reflective practice, because again, I don't think we can talk about this very often. So it first started creeping into the, the literature after the early 1980s. It was first described by Donald Schoen in 1983. I think it's important to understand the context in which it grew up in. So prior to then, um, you know, there were papers published and so on, but the evidence-based uh, uh, practice, the, the evidence-based medicine movement hadn't really uh, uh, sort of been around for very long. Guidelines were starting to um, be produced and so on, and people were starting to get really worried about this. Uh, about cookbook medicine and how do we relate these guidelines to the individual. So it arose in the context um, of, of evidence-based practice sort of emerging, but it was supposed to be a learning strategy for exploring professional knowledge, but to work out how you actually define that, how you translated that into appropriate care which was personalised to individuals. And a lot of people say, well, why do we bother? Isn't that just what we do? It's not scientific. And there is no conclusive research to show that reflective, uh, learn, reflective practice is effective. And of course it's biased. That's one of the criticisms. Deliberately or unconsciously, I've even heard it described as self-indulgent uh, naval reason. Well, um, and there are many drivers for reflective practice. There are intrinsic motivators and extrinsic motivators. Um, those of you who've done um, a little bit of psychology already will know that intrinsic motivators are much more effective in uh, driving uh, change. But there are a whole lot of extrinsic uh, reasons uh, or motivators. So there are political ones, there are professional ones, um, and, and then there are practical and more intrinsic personal motivators. So the political one is that the general public and government allow us as a profession to be self-regulated. But they expect something in return for that. They expect us to demonstrate that we're keeping up to date, that we're delivering higher standards of care to patients. And the GMC are very clear about that. We must be making our patients our first concern. There are professional extrinsic motivators, so in undergraduate education, in your portfolios, in your curriculum, you there will be an expectation that you demonstrate skills of reflection. 
um, and in postgraduate training as well. And, and, and for those um, trainees in the audience, um, you know, it's, it's there within the GMC um, uh, curricula or, uh, uh, and also within our own um, uh, psychiatric um, uh, uh, curricula. Um, Professional motivators and consultants, revalidation, um, having a license to practice means that we have an annual appraisal. So in our annual appraisals, we have our appraisers, we de develop a portfolio, we have discussions, we have to demonstrate that we're learning, that we have the skills to, 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 to learn. But practically, it's about supporting colleagues. When something goes wrong, my example that I gave uh, earlier on, it was really important for me to have colleagues that I could discuss it with, that we could reflect together. I think it's really important for well-being. Can you imagine trying to just sort of close the lid on that and move on? Uh, it's not going to go away. We need to be able to process that. And in terms of governance as well, so in, in terms of systems learning, it's really important to be able to reflect. And it just intuitively feels like Right thing to do. Does anybody know what this um, slightly blurry triangle is? <coughs> yep. Yeah. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Fantastic, thank you. So that's really important. Um, so, you know, and I will say this to, to, to people if you've got trainees or, or colleagues who are, you know, struggling uh, because they've just lost their flat or their accommodations have fallen. Through, talking about high level sort of self actualization, achieving our full potential and so on, it's not going to work if you're just come off nights and you're absolutely starving, hungry, and sleep deprived. It's probably uh, you know, not going to um, be at the right time to be talking about you know, how we achieve our full potential. We need to go home and have a good rest and get something to, to eat. But self-actualization, growing as a person, being able to achieve our full potential, is what Maslow uh, described as being the sort of pinnacle of, uh, of, 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 of human um, uh, achievement. So what is reflection? Again, I think we just go back to sort of basic uh, principles. There are two aspects. There is epistemological, so learning about our practice, and there's what's called ontological, learning about ourselves. I think in psychiatry, and this is my personal viewpoint, I think we've maybe drifted a little bit too much towards the second. It's really important. I think sometimes people drift away uh, in supervision from the learning about our practice uh, and knowledge to the second. Um, but you're not going to get too much of that in other specialties, and that's a good thing about psychiatry. It involves a whole lot of different skills. So, um, Cognitive um, uh, activity, so we need to have the skills of being able to analyse information, synthesise all of the facts that we um, uh, have to, together, and being able to evaluate uh, theory and knowledge, being able to look at the research. But is that it? It's much broader than that, isn't it? Because that stuff is all really scary, it's all very threatening. We have to be able to have emotional intelligence, we have to be able to have values, we have to have empathy in that we can put ourselves in the shoes of other people. We have to be able to tolerate uncertainty. Sometimes the answers are just not obvious. There's a lot of them. And that can be really difficult. Many of us like to think in <coughs> black and white terms. What is the answer? What is the right answer? Sometimes there is no right answer. And the ability to bear criticism either from ourselves, directed at ourselves, or perceiving it from other people. And that's tough. That's really tough. So what are the barriers to reflection? Well, this was me. Um, <laughs> I've been very courageous here showing you this slide. This was me preparing my talk you know, late in the night, feeling you know, not on my good and best. Do I want to portray that image of myself to the world? Or do I want to do the app that my kids uh, showed me? <laughs> 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 Celebrity app, right. It's great fun. My husband's delighted to come out of Barack Obama. <laughs> 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 so I'm talking about it soon. Um, 
So there are lots of barriers that get in the way of us looking really deeply into ourselves and really uh, being able to, to learn. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about um, a social psychologist and some theory. So Carol Dweck, prolific um, uh, social psychologist, she's done a lot of um, uh, research into learning, both with very small children through to undergraduate students. Um, and I'd commend you to read more about her if you're interested. This is one of her, her books. And Carol Dweck discovered that there were basically two groups of learners. So when she looked at small um, children, um, very neatly, um, they divide always into two groups of people. The one who believes that our ability to solve problems is fixed. <coughs> There's another group of people who believe that our ability to solve problems can develop and grow. So these two groups are called entity theorists, and people that believe that intelligence or problem solving ability is fixed, and incremental theorists who believe that, that we can um, develop and grow. And those very um, fundamental beliefs start early on in life, they're conditioned very early. And they lead to deep-seated beliefs about our ability to solve our problems. And that leads to uh, differences between these two groups in motivation, in choices and behaviours. And I kind of wish that I could invite this. <coughs> so entity theories believe that intelligence is fixed. So they prioritise looking smart. They prefer performance tasks. So if you um, gave a group of people that believe that intelligence is, is fixed by the choice of sitting in the exam or setting a learning objective, they're going to be much more comfortable saying I'll set the test um, and I'll get my score and I'll pass and so on. They just like challenge and really importantly tend to cope uh, less well with setbacks. So this group of small children she took um, and, and, and gave entity theorists in the group and the um, uh, incremental uh, theory children, some maths problems. So they were given maths problems, they were equally of equal intelligence, these two groups, given maths problems for their age group. The ones that, um, and then they did those ones were fine, and then they gave them maths problems for the next age group, so they kept going. So they're getting progressively harder, they were really out of their comfort zone doing challenges. Very interestingly, the, um, the people who were entity theorists, when they had the setbacks of the challenge, which of course it was going to be challenging, they were doing far too hard problems for their age group. When they went back to do the initial um, test that they'd done really, really well on, they performed more badly. Whereas the incremental theorists who'd been having progressively uh, significant challenge, when they went back to set the initial easier set of tests, they did better than they'd done before. And what she noticed was that those who are entity theorists tend to develop a helpless response. Um, they say things like, oh, I'm so stupid, you know, they, they did um, hold of, uh, recording what they said. They had plunging expectations of themselves. They got negative emotions, they felt really sad, and they had lower persistence uh, and decreased performance in um, the face of anxiety and uh, provoking the challenge. Whereas the incremental um, theorists tended to say things like, rather than I'm so stupid, they would say things like, it's okay, mistakes were from friends. These were American kids, so you know, <laughs> we've taken a little bit of cultural um, uh, context into account. Um, so, her key findings were that our belief about ourselves influences our choices in learning. So, as I said, the entity theorists more likely to want to do an exam than to set themselves a learning objective. And interestingly, she did a study with Hong Kong undergraduates um, and offered people who English wasn't their first language the opportunity to have additional um, uh, English lessons. The group who were entity theorists were much more likely to turn that down than the intermental theorists. So we worry about students who are entity theorists, you know, and there is support and offer maybe be more uh, uh, likely to turn that down. Entity theorists tend to be focused on a fear of failure. 
Um, and I look at myself, and I look at the sort of failure experiences I've had. I was probably an empty theorist. I've had to work very hard in life to become an incremental theorist. But incremental theorists welcome opportunities for growth. And both groups perform equally well until they hit failure. And it means that entity theorists are educationally vulnerable. So those are the students who do really well at primary school, maybe to secondary school. It's a difficult environment to challenge those up. Uh, they hit failure and they sometimes really struggle with that. We perceive failure and sometimes really struggle with that. Change from um, you know, foundation program to core training, uh, change from school to university, and so on. Grace, can I just check how we're doing with the time? So, beliefs about intelligence um, developed very early on in life. Interesting, I thought this was interesting, that praising success in performance, I wish I'd known about this before I had kids as well, promotes entity theorists. So if you're saying, well oh, done, you're a very clever girl, you then start linking uh, that with your um, with self-esteem. So performance becomes very powerfully linked to whether you're good or bad. And we should be saying to children, you work really hard on that. That's good. Um, so self-esteem then becomes inextricably linked to performance. And entity theory drives um, competition. We end up with winners and losers in life. And interestingly, we could probably spend quite a lot of time talking about this, and we won't, but girls are more likely to be entity theorists. <coughs> That's great, it gives them initial advantage at school, um, but longer term vulnerability um, to um, hitting challenge uh, and self perceived failure. Entity theorists are more likely to stereotype others, and that's important for me and my generation and, and, and all teachers because if you're an entity theorist and you have uh, strongly held beliefs that intelligence or problem solving ability is. is capped, it's limited, uh, we project those views onto other people, so we're less likely uh, to, uh, or we're more likely to give up on others when they hit challenge for our students. <coughs> There's some good news in there that, that um, although the uh, beliefs are relatively stable, we can change them, we can influence them to an extent in the medium term. Um, and there's also some good evidence that teaching students, and well, I think we probably ought to be te teaching uh, students at secondary school and at undergraduate level, uh, can influence um, self-perception as well. There's some quite good evidence uh, <coughs> that it can reduce our stereotype threat of ourselves uh, when we give teaching specifically on incremental theory. Um, so, I think that's really, really important to think about how we grow and develop. And, and in popular kind of uh, culture, Carol Dweck's work has become known as the growth that mindset. And you can access it through some of her academic uh, essays, but there are also some more populist um, books that she's written um, as well. And I'll just talk really briefly about um, reflections and, and models of reflection, because again, people get kind of caught up on you know, the right way to reflect. There is no right way to reflect. There is no right way to learn. It has to be valued by the individual. There are a whole lot of different frameworks you can use. Um, some work in, uh, better in other situations uh, than others. We can uh, use writing to reflect. We can um, talk about reflection. We can think about reflection. We can reflect with others. Uh, we can be very creative. We can write poems or plays. Um, and I'm not going to go into the different models, but just to say that there are several different models and quite a useful summary of the different reflective practice that models is at the Academy of Medical and Medical Colleges Reflective Practice Toolkit. Um, my very favourite reflective framework is Morton, which is really simple. What, so what, and what is easy to carry around that would be. And then the ultimate, I sort of reflecting, <coughs> uh, I would suggest, is sort of qualitative research where you, you know, speak to a whole load of people and you try to uh, quantify that uh, in, a, in a very structured way. 
So I just want to say, well, reflection is just simply learning to improve our uh, practice. It's absolutely key to developing as a leader. And I hope that I've shown you a bit of personal uh, reflection today and what I've learned from that. It has two parts. It's about learning about our practice, but it's also in the process learning about ourselves. There are external uh, requirements and we need to be seen to do it, but achieving our true professional potential uh, as uh, Maslow's hierarchy demands it of us. There are no right ways to learn, but some tools can be to structure and they may or may not be helpful. But our underlying beliefs about ourselves can make us, uh, or many of us, educationally vulnerable. And our beliefs about ourselves influence our beliefs about others. Educational vulnerability in the context of failure can get in the way and it can worsen our performance. And I think that's really important to hang on to. When you're going through a hard time and you're being challenged, um, just to remember that our self-beliefs about ourselves can make us vulnerable in those situations. It can be modified and I think teaching and learning about learning theory early on is important. And in psychiatry, one of the most wonderful things is that we have opportunities as educators to influence our trainees, uh, educational experiences, because we have psychiatric supervision. Every week of postgraduate training, our trainees have a whole hour of protected one-to-one -one with their supervisors, something that isn't replicated in any other specialty. And getting to know our trainees well is just something that we do. So I can have these kind of conversations with my trainees about success, about failure, about what they're thinking about them, themselves, about how that fits in with you know, learning practices <coughs> and so on. And developing our own growth mindset and supporting others to do so fits in with key values that leaders need of collaboration, respect and excellence. And I think we really owe it to our patients to keep learning throughout our lives. And you can learn to lead. Leadership is not something like intelligent, it's not a date. We can learn the skills. Role modeling is really important. I hope I've done a bit of role modeling today and shown you crummy photographs of myself in PowerPoint um, that I probably rather have uh, left buried at home. I hope I've uh, told you all about the failures, about things that I've got wrong in my life as well as things I've got right. And I'd also say, why do we always reflect on when things go wrong? That's where we quite often hit reflective practice when we start talking about the wrong things. I think we should start focusing on analysing why things have gone well, because I think that can help to an extent desensitise us to reflective criticism. Very, very quickly, the 10 lessons and I've added two uh, lessons of leadership, understanding the aware of others' agendas, be aware of setting others up to fail. We can't do things on our own. We need a common shared goal that others are signed up to. We need to be able to safely reflect and talk about developing as a leader. The leaders are not born. Values-based decisions never get you into trouble, or not very serious trouble anyway. Leaders need to be kind to themselves and realise that a good result may look different from the norm that we initially envisaged. We're all human, vulnerable, and need to take care of our own well-being. We need to be the change we want to see. Between us, we have the solutions. Listening is key. But also, values are key, and reflecting and learning is critical. So, just to finish off the words of Winston Churchill success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. And that is it. Thank you.